Yeah. But councils don't care. Local authorities don't get all they can see is this is our pot of money for this year. And that's our concern. I don't know. There'll be a child that's just gone into primary school now and they will probably go through the same issues that my son did if they're a bit different or if they have an additional need. And that is just not okay with me. And I know it's not okay with all the guests, including yourself that come on this podcast, because we're trying to make noise. We're trying to do these complaints, get judged actually by other parents. Like, what are they complaining about? (laughs) I'm like, do you know what? Just, we don't need this. It's like, I'm not complaining for the sake of complaining sake. I'm complaining because the impact of you failing my child is massive and that has to be addressed. We can see what doesn't exist and choose to rise above what is. Mum to millionaire.com. Hello and welcome back to the Mum to Millionaire podcast. This is where we support mums through adversity. We cover hard hitting topics and we profile women just like our amazing guests today. And the whole point of this podcast is not only to share stories, but it's also to help you to find your voice and reclaim your power. Now, I'm going to read out our guest's um, Twitter bio today, because I think this describes all of us women who are literally fighting some kind of battle in our lives. The typical girl next door with a strong passion for fighting discrimination and injustices in today's crazy, messed up world. I love that. Please welcome to the show, Beth. Hi. (laughs) Hi, Hi. Beth. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you. Do you know what? Firstly, thank you so much for coming on because not only is it a full-time job being a mum, it's a full-time job working, but it's also a full-time job having children with extra needs. And it's also a full-time job fighting the system that should be there to support them. So today we're going to be kind of talking about personal budgets and explaining more about what that is. But before we get into that topic, I want Beth to explain, Beth, what is going on? And, and why are we here? <laughs> In this situation. Uh, I don't even know where to start with that one. <laughs> yeah. And we were just saying this actually, I was just saying to Beth before we hit record, when you are trying to find out about someone's life and story, it's really difficult, isn't it? Because it will usually start with one thing, but then you are exposed to so many failings of the system, so much discrimination, so much injustice. And it's like, well, where do we start? So I'm going to make yeah. it difficult for you and try and summarise, Beth. <laughs> <laughs> what, what has we, happened? We had a very, very sort of unique sort of start to it because when my eldest was born, she was sort of identified as, as having additional needs from day one. So I think she was going to need support. And so she had what was then, as now as an EHCP, but was then a statement of needs from when she was at nursery at about 18 months, which now is a, like practically impossible to get put in place now. I think then things were a lot simpler than what they are now. And she had full-time one-to-one support from nursery, basically, oh. the whole way through. And we got that put in place really, really easily. So for me, the system was, I never saw the challenges at all to start with. And even when she was going to, so I moved into primary school, and the primary school had a unit and she still had this one-to-one. And even I had to then say she she drunk her, her, her freezer thing in her lunch pack one day and they phoned me panicked, having to phone the poison control centre. And, and I said, now's the time we need to have lunchtime support in place. <laughs> so <laughs> everybody's saying to me, oh, you'll never get that, you'll never get that. And they authorised it right away. So I was like, oh, OK, so I'm not seeing any of these challenges. Fast forward to my second child, who's diagnosed with um, autism and an anxiety disorder, dyslexia, that sort of spectrum of things. And getting hers was just, I was floored because I couldn't believe all these years later that it was such a struggle. And it was suddenly like, now I get where you're coming from. <laughs> you know? yeah. Now I understand what all these other parents. What, before we move on with that, what, do you think changed then why was it 
the support was in place and you were kind of oblivious, yeah. weren't you, to what what yeah. does go on? What changed from your first to second child, do you think, in the system? I think funding cuts, definitely big time funding cuts, especially for for education side of things with mainstream schools. Mm. I think if your child has severe needs and you are having to get them into an SEN school, I think that's a lot easier, which is just bizarre because you'd think, you know, if, where's the every child matters and that kind of narrative. Um, oh God, don't get me started on that. <laughs> Being no. so new into this failings of the system, I'm like, that gets kicked to the curb because yep. all children don't matter. No. <laughs> they don't. No. If, if they're no. a little bit different, it seems like we don't want them in school. And what no. I have found as well, and I'm not sure if any of your children are in special school, but I went to see a head teacher recently of a special school. And even the way he was talking about children who don't behave appropriately, and he actually said to me, he doesn't want the badly behaved kids. My yeah. mind, and this was only a few days ago, I am i don't have words because special schools no. are really there to support those kids that the mainstream don't want. So yeah. I don't really understand yeah. <laughs> what's going on here. It's really difficult. I mean, I supported a family just the other week and the same kind of thing. We have a send policy, but we don't have a send behaviour policy because we have the same high expectations for every single child. Well, so how does that work with the Equality Act then? Well, um, we do make reasonable adjustments, but we still expect them to shake hands and make eye contact with the teachers when they come in from outside. And I'm like, that's just a nightmare for anybody on the autistic spectrum, do you know, because that whole, you will make eye contact, you will shake hands. I was like, and apart from that, how does that work with COVID, the whole handshake? taking thing you know at a time when we're withdrawing from that and you're still forcing it to be in place it's the whole you know round hole square peg it's not gonna it's just never gonna be a good fit no which is a that... shame because the whole the whole point of if you get when you find a school that is actually inclusive and you have that experience you suddenly see how just these tiny little things that are made from without them even thinking really isn't it because when you when it's properly inclusive it's done from day one you don't have to request it because it's already in place yeah. then you come across a school that doesn't have that and you're facing fight after fight after fight detentions for an ADHD child that won't do homework mm -hmm. detentions for this detentions for fidgeting in class okay. that kind of thing you just think oh how have we got to a place where everybody has to conform to be the same when I mean we it used to be where you were praising children for being unique because that's that's their superpower that's their thing you know we don't all need to be the same having a different take on things and working together to look at everybody's perspective should be the core thing not mm -hmm. oh, we'll all just be sheep and sort of conform and sit here quietly and you know just no you don't do that in the workplace oh, so why you is it said what's on my mind yeah. all the time it's... Beth is we should be celebrating these yeah. children and actually encouraging the people that are sat there and just listening to what the teacher says actually encourage them do you know what you can think for yourself like be yeah. creative and we have to put that in place for the truth oh, I just feel the whole educational system is a complete mess but what what has changed has anything changed I mean from your experience it's actually got worse <laughs> so yeah, it's, de it's definitely got worse I mean even you know, when you think about, in terms of funding, so one good example is when Rebecca was born, she was born in Scotland mm -hmm. and they had a system called Prescat then where we were from. And so when she was identified at birth as having disabilities, she was going to have to have OT, speech and language, educational input. She was going to have health input. There's a pot of funding put aside and then they meet every six months. So that funding's there from day one. How have we got to it being then you know, or you have to wait till a child is six to have a diagnosis and you can't access this until you've got a diagnosis. When actually, no, that's not the law. But local authorities are busy telling parents this because parents, um, so, uh, they, where do they look? Where do they look? Everything's so kept secret and behind, you know, it's hush-hush and you can only access it if you come across somebody that says, do you know, actually, you would be entitled to this, that and this, and you, your child has a right to access education. And, you know, the fact that they are denying you that is actually a breach of the law. And then you suddenly sit as a parent and you're like, 
oh well they didn't tell me that bit (laughs) and this is what oh it's 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 like what you said it's it's hidden it's like they don't Mm. want you to know this information until you say something and then they're like oh yeah we can do that oh we'll put you in the way and I'm like but why did you not tell me this from the start like it makes no sense and what and I know you've had a lot of issues as well with your local authority why do you believe they do this like I don't understand the end goal here of local authorities to hide because information they don't, they don't think beyond although they'll talk the talk about early intervention being best they, oh, they um, don't do it do they oh yeah yeah no <laughs> It's, it's all about, so, and the irony is, if they were to put that early intervention into place, it would probably cost the council less in the long run. Because by the time you add the trauma of not being supported and everything else onto that child, you're actually going to have to put more support in place two years down the line. Yeah. But councils don't care, local authorities don't care. All they can see is, this is our pot of money for this year. And that's our concern, this year's pot of money, not next year's pot of money, because let's face it, I'll probably have been promoted for doing a rubbish job in this role by that time. So, (laughs) you know, it's just, it's kind of like they're, well, it's not my worry. And they just pass it down. It's why they all force parents to go to tribunal, because, well, in the six months it's taken to go to tribunal, we've saved six months of funding. And you think, oh... And, and this is what is this is like my direct appeal to people working lo- local authorities. It's like just do the work in the first place because you're putting everyone under stress. They're actually making their own jobs more difficult. Like even yeah. now, I'm emailing and calling the council all the time. It's a waste of everyone's time and energy. Like what yeah. is there is no point towards it. No. Everyone can just work together. <laughs> from the beginning and it's like what you said you've made so many incredible points already and it's even if that early intervention was actually put in place so many of these kids would just be in school they're just being this mainstream school and then we can focus on making that school these schools incredible for everyone and then we can actually have the special schools for the children that have got very, very complex needs. Because I think yeah. what's happened now, there's a, a lot of kids, and I think my son's that prime example, he hasn't got a diagnosis for anything. He he was a victim of domestic abuse. He's been through so much trauma. So that behavior that he exhibited in school, they're like, oh, we don't want this. Let's just chuck yeah. him out. And yeah. now the council are actually gonna probably end up spending thousands more on him to access something whenever he does eventually get into another school but what was the point when they could have probably chucked in I don't know two grand to his last school and got some really great therapy it's um it just seems so like it makes me frustrated that I'm even having these conversations (laughs) I totally get that I totally get that it's it's crazy it's like the so we're with Rebecca and covid when she had both girls have obviously got the EHCP but where Colby had been she had been bullied for 18 months at her primary school and the school done barely anything to start it was just and for the first sort of six months of that she was telling an adult consistently and the adult was like oh it's just that child because that's how he is because by that point he'd bullied about 10 kids in the, the, the year group sort of thing and I was like well no because in her head being autistic she had done the right thing by telling the adult so she ticked it off it was done and I've just got to live like that now and because she told the adult in school she hadn't told us at home so that went on for about 18 months so then lockdown I took them through all the complaints process and everything as you do to try and get them and they did eventually step up then and remove them for a class and sort of kept them separate which was fine but he was still going out of his way to target her and I think it was more a, a situation where he was then getting attention for it. So it was a really difficult situation to balance. But whereas Rebecca struggled, she's a people person. She likes her routine of she loves going to college, she loves going to school. She loves the, just the interaction with her peers and people. She just is such a people person. She hated lockdown. She hated it. She wouldn't even go out for a walk. So her mental health really struggled with having nothing in place. Colby flourished because she could pick her own routine now she was in her safe space she didn't have to deal with people she was good with that her self-confidence was up here she went back to school such a different child completely different and it was so good it done her the world of good and that was why 
when I put the formal complaint into the local authority about Rebecca's not having any provision of an EHCP, I didn't put one in for Colby because it didn't impact Colby. Yeah. It only impacted Rebecca. So it was just like, I'm not complaining for the sake of complaining sick. I'm complaining because the impact of you failing my child is massive and that has to be addressed sort of thing. But they don't, they don't like you to point out where they've failed. And it's like, well, I'm going to point out every single time until you improve your service. And that's just wasting my time. But I've got time to waste. You don't. Mm. You know, because as a parent, it takes me five minutes to fire off an email. But mm. you're a local authority. You have to tick all so, so many boxes every time you get a complaint. And you have to be accountable for that. Yeah. I don't have to be accountable, but you do. So, you know, it makes no sense that they force parents into that path and then then complain that, well, parents are complaining. <laughs> you know? It's a it's no like, brainer. Do your job in the first yeah. place. And my, I want to be that. And all of us are, are, aren't we, that would go through this process. Like, we are advocates for learn your lessons. Like, yes. I want this. And this is unfortunately, this won't happen. And I'm a very yeah. positive person, but I'm just going to be realistic. Same. I would love this to end with my son in this specific school he's still on roll with and within Oxfordshire, the area that we live in. But I know it's not going to end with him. And that yeah. is what makes me emotional. Like yeah. I can't, like, I don't know, there'll be a child that's just gone into primary school now and they'll probably go through the same issues that my son did. If they're a bit different or if they have an additional need and that is just not okay with me. And I know it's not okay with all the guests, including yourself that come on this podcast because we're trying to make noise. We're trying to do these complaints, get judged actually by other parents. Like, what are they complaining yeah. about? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, do you know what? Just, we don't need this. We're dealing with walk enough. A Just be yeah, quiet. Walk a day in our shoes and then tell me you wouldn't be complaining yourself. Exactly. You know? they, they, they cannot come out and say, like the Every Child Matters thing again. They have their slogans and everything else. And that's all well and good. But if you're not going to back that up with, you know, service users' feedback being taken into account and actually leading to changes. Yeah. W w what do you do with that? You know, I mean, it's it's the same old thing. For years, we've been feeding back as parents to the likes of things with school transport. And again, we had a massive issue with school transport for Rebecca when she first started. I always took her. Then when she started special school, um, it was further away. So, and I had COVID to get to school as well. So, um, she went on school transport for the first time and it was such, because she has all the health conditions, she had her own transport where I went to one, which was all well and good until on the first day, they took her to the wrong address. They got lost getting to the wrong address, but they'd input her address wrong on the system. They had taken the wrong phone number down. So phoned somebody, some random stranger, wasn't me, and took two hours and they hadn't, even told the one-to-one -one that she had to have access to her snacks and drinks in the car because she's hypoglycemic. So she has to eat every 20 minutes. She was in the car for two hours. She arrived home nearly comatose. She was literally, our blood sugars were like below zero on our machine. It took me about a week to rectify it. And when I phoned them to talk about it, the, the transport person told me that I have to expect teething troubles with transport. <laughs> what <laughs> just no, what sorry what I always just it's not often that I'm speechless but that just I was just that's not a teething trouble that's negligence you know you can't you can't do that and then they were like oh well you know we'll, we'll learn lessons but they didn't because you know for years and, and that we keep saying as parents to especially to like Surrey County Council mm -hmm. who are spending have one of the highest budgets for home to school transports in like the UK and we are saying you know if you had some kind of parent app where because a lot of these children only attend school 70% of the time because of their health they have chronic health needs that mean they can't access school 100% of the time so why are you paying for that 30% yeah. when the child's not traveling so you know it makes sense if you had like a parent app where the parent logs the child in in the morning mm -hmm. and then you know in at the end of the day then you know that that transport's been done and been required exactly. and then you know and, and it would save you millions of pounds oh probably in the God, this is a, don't get me started on saving money <laughs> exactly but they don't want to save money in any kind of sort of productive way because that would be far too productive yeah. you know 
and, and we couldn't do that because it came from a parent so we couldn't couldn't possibly do that and, you and know. Again, this is what gets me frustrated again because I hear stories from people like yourself and it's like if they saved all this money in all these areas, they would actually be so much funding to fund special schools, to fund, to yeah. help children with additional needs, and actually to then put money into these mainstream schools, which all children yeah. should be able to go and access anyway. So again, it's like this vicious cycle. So I hate when people say there's no money, because I'm like, no, there is. Because just not, it, yeah, you, yeah, not accessing it and you're wasting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're, you're wasting Very. money. And you hit on something else there. I, I want people to understand if they're maybe not going through what thousands of other parents are. And it's this, once something happens to your child once, that then impacts this kind of snowball effect of all these other failings. So you finally, you know, you've got support for your child now, she's going to a special school, but then there's now a hold on, is the taxi gonna come on time? As the taxi, like you said, did they have the right address? And it's all yeah. these, and then you don't wanna be, and I've got that with <clears throat> in my situation at the moment where he's not in school, they've created this weird alternative provision for him. So yes, they're giving him some tutoring. Then he comes home, he'll watch TV. He'll go back out for a little bit. But sometimes the tutor's ill. Sometimes the tutor didn't actually go to the lesson. Sometimes things are canceled. And it's like, how many things do I have to make noise? And you don't want to be that parent because yeah. you're already yeah. blamed and shamed for your child not being able to access the mainstream school anyway. So how many yeah. people can I complain to? <laughs> it's like, how yeah. far do you go? But again, I feel you've got, have you felt that, that you have to actually put that complaint in to, yes. to make sure it's kind of, what's the word? It's like recorded, isn't it? I think it definitely is that because if you don't put it in, and this is, I think, the, one of the biggest problems actually, because a lot of parents just genuinely don't have the energy to do the complaint process. But I think if you have got the on energy, do it every time, because that's the only way that they get the feedback. I mean, a big believer in giving them positive feedback when they get it right, which I've always done. Like this year with transport, Rebecca's was organized by July and I had confirmation that she was keeping her last transport and the, the escort sort of thing. So it was all going to be the same, the same car, the same driver, the same escort. Brilliant. And I knew from very early on. So I was like, that, you know, that's amazing. You don't understand the difference that, that makes to her which then makes a difference to the whole family because she's not stressing about it. It's something that's it's done, it's ticked, it's gone. Um, so they do, sometimes they learn. That kind of thing, I do think they learn because the year before, but again, the year before when they messed it up again, I sued them for it because mm. that's the only way you can get them to actually stop and take note of where they're going wrong mm. in order to fix the processes that aren't working sort of thing. And for and everyone that's the, that's the saddest thing actually that yeah, they push parents to that level of yeah. it's like now I've, I've done every single thing you could possibly and I'm sure you've done this Beth as well you do everything you can I sit there look out into the sky oh what else can I do today who else can I contact <laughs> until the last step is you instruct a solicitor you go yeah. down the legal route you mm -hmm. And it's like, just, but why? <laughs> why? It should never parents? have to be that hard. It should never no. have to be that hard. Especially when, you know, you've got parents that are facing so many more challenges than what they should have to anyway. Yeah. And they, you know, they, they aren't raising these things to the local authorities to be a pain in their backside. They're raising them because they can see that their child is suffering because of the failings that they're, they're having made against them. And that's the worst of it. So it's like kicking them while they're, while they're down. You know, it's, it's just, and anybody that's okay with that, there's something not quite right there. No. Because to, to overlook that, even if you're in a position to sort of even change it a little bit, mm. then do it. Because, you know, karma, I'm a big believer in karma. Mm. And it will come back. If you don't do your best in the role that you're in, where you have a capacity to do something that makes even the tiniest of changes, then there's something far wrong there, isn't there? It's just it you're encouraging and the system to be broken. Exactly. And it's that what I find very concerning is that everyone in the councils and schools and th those kind of authorities, they've normalized this. 
So it's normal to not provide support to a child. It's normal to get ignored. And then when people complain, it's like they're expecting the parents, it's probably like they're waiting for the parents. Yeah. But then why is that normalized? <laughs> Again, it shouldn't be like that. It's accepted. It's just accepted. And you just think, well, that acceptance is actually the biggest part of the problem. It's not the parents that are the problem. It's not the children having difficulties that's the problem. It's the accepting that you are not going to get that support put in place unless you have a fight on your hand. Mm. And that's just beyond wrong. You know, they should be working. And that, that's the thing. If they did work together with parents, even just uh, in the capacity of give us your feedback, give us your ideas on how we can improve, and then we'll put a task force together. We'll look at this, you know, logistically on what could possibly be done. Even if you got one good idea out of that, that then saved your service a hundred pounds. You've still that's worked good. productively with the parents and the parents will have a teeny tiny bit of trust there that you've actually listened to them. You've taken it on board. You've changed something in the system. And even though it's a teeny tiny thing, that's a big thing because you can then see, okay, Moving on to the next thing. Yeah, <laughs> tick one box. <laughs> Let's go to the next. <laughs> it's like what you're explaining, and I really believe in this, is simple solutions. It's yes. effective communication. It's all these things that actually don't cost money. And actually, I'm going to go right back to the first point you made at the beginning of the podcast when I said kind of what has changed, and you mentioned about obviously the funding's not there. Now, I believe now, again, because it's been normalised, that's kind of like a get out of jail free card, isn't it? For a lot of people, they're like, oh, the funding's not there. And then it's like, okay, well, so what do you want me to do now as a parent? Just just give up. Yeah. It's, it's like they're like, that's their like line. There, there's no funding. But mm. then the other thing which I've experienced, and I'm sure, Beth, you have probably many stories of this, is so many people lack empathy. There is yeah. no... Um, like they know now I'm my hours that I can work are significantly reduced so my income mm -hmm. is very very minimal now they don't care I have a mortgage to pay they don't care I'm a single mum I told them a few months ago I was suicidal they didn't care about that like no. you tell them all this stuff verbally I documented it in emails and letters and what has changed nothing, nothing. I love yeah. it how Beth said it at the same time because she knew. <laughs> she yeah, knew nothing just, has changed. It is it's just, it is not, I don't, and I don't think it ever will for a very long time until the actual sort of processes in place change and until, well, until they are actually held accountable. How can they be held accountable when even though if you go through all of their processes and then you go to LGO and then you go, even what an LGO outcome doesn't, guarantee you that they're going to do as they're told because they don't have to because who's who's enforcing that yeah and nobody is that and i rang the so the lgo is the local government of bidsman i only found yes. out that recently by going through the whole complaint process so we'll get in a, an investigator assigned to us within eight weeks yeah. um which will then by the time they finish their investigation will probably be late until 2022 and even for that, I, I rang them up to see what was going on. Like, mate, like my, my, my child's still out of school. Like, what, what shall I do? Yeah. And when I rang them, I said, I, I was like, can you just explain to me this? Because I don't really understand this process. They're like, right, we didn't get investigator. We investigate what's going on. And I go, yeah, then what happens? They go, well, we then reckon, I pay very careful attention now to people's language. Mm -hmm. So they said, we give the council recommendations. And I went, Right. So does that mean that the council can read your recommendations and not act upon it? And they were like, yeah. And I went, right. Yeah. But they did say in like 90 something percent of cases, they will listen and yeah. make change. Well, it's not even make change. They're just do whatever the LGO we're said. Made to do in the first place. <laughs> as, exactly. And then again, it just makes you think, why go through that whole, that's going to take me a year probably. Like, what's the point? Yeah. What, what, what's the point? It's delay tactics, mm. because in that time, your son still hasn't accessed any of the support that he's entitled to. He hasn't accessed the education portion that he's entitled to, the health support, the mental health support, the counselling, everything that they are actually meant to be putting in place for him. Well, we can 
put that off another year because, well, that's next year's funding pot. We don't need to look at it. And yet the LGO will probably say, we'll make a, make a payment to them to, to, you know, for their, their suffering and what they've gone through. That'll be a minimal amount of money compared to the funding that should have been put in place when the need was identified for the support. So they're still saving. Whatever way you look at it, they're still saving and still not being held properly accountable. Because although the LGO published the findings, who who actually goes and looks for those? Again, it's, and as a parent, yeah. you don't know. I've never thought, oh, today, let me go and research yeah. how many other parents yeah. <laughs> in this county, and let me read their reports. And again, that's another concerning thing. When I have read some of those reports, when I found out, I thought, oh, what's this LGO? It's like a yeah. ray of sunshine. You're like, yes, another thing. And then you hear other parents' experiences. Yes. And it's like- And it's dire. Oh, Okay, <laughs> so I still believe that, and we'll go we'll go into some tips now before again we talk about personal budgets. But again, it's one of my tips being actively going through this is just try everything you can. Like I know it's so draining as a parent, but if you don't make that noise, this is yeah. all unrecorded. This problem does not exist if people don't yeah. document it. So do the formal. Uh, council complaint procedure do the school complaint procedure if they're still on roll or still at that school um go to the department of education just send emails and make sure you're, yep. you've written a list of every go to your mp my mp yep. has been highly not uh what's that word engaged in this yep. process in a nice way <laughs> yep. mine's would be the same <laughs> Um, so it's just, and um, what else, Beth? Councillors, your, your local councillor, I have found that my local councillors have been much more supportive when I've had issues. And even oh. though a lot of them don't understand, and they'll tell you they don't understand the processes and they don't understand, you know, the system as it is, I still have found just copying them in an email. Well, suddenly you've got somebody else that's, that's accountable there. And, I mean, I've gone as far as when it's been... Like, things with a head teacher previously with, with Rebecca uh, don't even get me started on that parents need to learn to grieve for the child they never have no <laughs> so and we, with that one I went to everybody that I could department for education Ofsted teaching standards the SEN forum that you sat on everything I left no stone unturned because it made my blood boil every time I thought about it so I had to make sure that I had done every process that I could just to ensure that the school learn and he learn it's not appropriate <laughs> you know it's not your place to say that and that took a long time to sort of finalize as well but I think it is just a paper trail of everything mm -hmm. if you keep a paper trail even if it's a phone call follow up with an email of what was discussed what the action points are who's doing what and always copy yourself in and then just save it in a file and it's saying then it's not actual paperwork it's just an email and so you're not sort of mentally drawn I find like you know when you've done a subject access request and it, requires, it comes like this mm -hmm. and you think oh and every time I look at it I think oh but if it's in a file <laughs> in my phone I don't even give it headspace literally I can send an email and then it's gone it doesn't play in my mind it doesn't it just that's my sort of compartmentalizing bit it's just gone and that's and such a done. great tip if you can and again no parent expects like I again I think I'm still living every day in shock in all yeah. honesty that we're going through this if I knew this was going to happen from day one he started his secondary school I would have done copied the email to myself made a fault yeah. so I've now spent no I didn't have some holidays this year it was just yeah. every day it was going through my emails and because sometimes I got so frustrated with the school I've just deleted stuff and yeah. that's I don't know what that's obviously disappeared now I'm like well that was great of me to but because I didn't know I would get to this stage so if something is happening in your child's life at the moment start doing it now because trust me yes. you're going to save yourself so much anger and frustration aren't you by doing it in Definitely. the latter so do exactly what Beth says, like email. <laughs> and I loved your tip as well about, um, cause that's, Beth, so you've given me an idea. That's one thing I haven't even done. I don't even know who my local Project counselor is. <laughs> I'm excited today. I'm like, oh, yay. So I went to the MP. I forgot to go to the blooming counselor, didn't I? So I'm going to go and do a little Google search later, see who that is, send, yeah. just reword my letter that I sent to my MP today um, to that counselor. And, also and your cabinet members 
Oh, well, I'm actually the asking members members because okay. you have, I'm writing down you have the cabinet. Yeah, you've got the cabinet members for um, children and families, and you also have the cabinet member for education. You'll have um, a, usually have a um, cabinet member for health who you could also involve because it involves has the impact on his mental health. So I just involve everybody and then. And, and is this them... all in the different councils? So every this council. For like one, yeah, for one local, every local authority will have a board and they'll all be sitting there waiting for your emails now. <laughs> oh, yeah. They'll be like, oh, what? We're, we're waiting for Vina. <laughs> it's, it is, it's just keeping everybody accountable to their peers because nobody wants to look as if they're not doing anything. There, there's, you know, there's this parent who's coming to every single one of them for support. One of them's going to want to work with you. And if the other ones are seen to not be replying or anything, then you report it to the monitoring officer because the monitoring officer's job is to ensure that these people are doing what they're meant to be doing, what their roles are. Right, you know entailed. what, Beth? We need to backtrack it because you're saying so much stuff. I thought I'd bloom and everything, but I. <laughs> so I'm going to do this for all the other parents as well. So let's just yes. backtrack. So, <laughs> number one, you do the formal complaint procedure yes. with the council. Two, yeah. I think I need to write this in a blog post now yeah. because <laughs> it is very rare someone's going to have pen and paper listening to a podcast. Two, go through the formal complaint procedure with the school. That one I'm finding to be the most drooling. I'm on stage three at the moment and there's five stages and this started yeah. a very long, but it's all right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going with that. Um, number three, the local MP, write yeah. to them. Number four, um, Department of Education. Number five, mm -hmm. Ofsted. We haven't mentioned that one, have we? Uh, number six. Okay. So these are the new ones. Number six is councillors of your local yes. area. Yes. Number seven, cabinet members. So we can write yes. to the children and families and potentially health as yeah. well. Yeah. And you'll have an education cabinet member as well. Oh, okay. And education as well. Okay. So there's potentially three different... Yeah cabinet members i don't know what point we're on now i think number eight number eight was the mon what was the, what monitor, the monitoring officer at the council oh, so okay. their role is to ensure that the cabinet members are fulfilling the role that they are sitting in so if you write to your cabinet member and they don't respond to you then you can contact the monitoring officer and say well I wrote to them in their capacity of the role that they're in and they haven't responded. They will, because generally been, they know that parents will just take it further. Yes. Um, but it's their job to make sure that they have thoroughly answered your query or supported you in whatever it is that you're asking. So it's definitely one that I always sort of follow up with. Wow. For sure. Okay, monitoring. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> I'm learning so I'm like, oh, I've got a full pack day now a bit later on. I'm gonna have to do all this other stuff. And um and then it's it's just I think also just contacting different people in your council. Cause what I've also recently realized is that a specific department may know what's going on with your child, but another yeah. department don't. So I think I got in contact with like the attendants department I don't know what I think they've got a different name and I actually said to them do you know what my son has been marked at at school and they said no and I was like in my head I'm thinking so do you actually know he's actually not in school so it's even within the council it's just like it's amazed but yeah. one of the left hand doesn't speak to the right hand that's I mean that's so obvious especially with when, it, when there's um special educational needs involved you are hard pushed and then you've got the whole fact that case officer turnovers I know in our local authority is like you could start the week with one case officer and end the week with a new one because they've came in they've left and it's like why is there such and why is nobody paying attention to the fact that there's such a high turnover of staff or something fundamentally wrong in your service if you are having such a high turnover of staff so you don't have any continuity with some of the local authority staff which yeah. then means you have a lack of communication between the departments and it, that just adds impact to the families that are trying to contact them. It's exactly, it's like yeah. some kind of mad circus. Because then that that person that and again we we've had this and we I don't even know I don't know endless amounts of people involved in this now within the council. And when someone new comes in, I'm just like great. I'm like, have yes, they even read that. the notes? Because yeah. 
I just had like a massive meeting with the person before you and they said they were going to do X, Y, and Z. And clearly that's probably not going to happen now because yeah. <laughs> have, has that new person even read what has gone on? It's just, I don't even know. So, do you know, we were supposed to talk about personal budgets and um, we just, I, <laughs> I think Beth, we're going to have to get you on again to talk about personal budgets. But that's this fine. is what happens isn't it because and we said it right at the beginning once you start talking about one thing this is so, and you actually said the word it's a frigging maze it's yeah, a maze it really is you go down one way you're like yes you're getting somewhere and then it's like no it's a dead end oh retreat yeah. retreat come back yeah. start again go and chase and you're it. either you're either labeled as difficult or anxious that's how one of my favorites oh mum's mum's anxiety Mm, mum's anxiety wouldn't be there if you'd done your job <laughs> mum wouldn't be difficult if you'd done your job <laughs> and mum has a name <laughs> oh yes <laughs> I'm so proud of Beth you were just telling me weren't you before we started recording you were like in meetings you're like I'm not mum my yeah. name is Beth yeah and I, I think even to say that out loud to people and it, maybe it sounds a bit silly me saying this but I think that even takes courage because if you go into meetings by yourself and you're yeah. with like six seven other people for you to actually stand up and go do you know what can you call me by my name I'm not yeah. just blah blah's mum like I do have yeah. an identity of my it's own that, that. but the I always I've always done it it's something I've always done with somebody does that and I'll just say I'll use their job role back to them and they just stop like the penny just drops it's like oh okay I done that didn't I and I've had one one um a senko that had said I don't believe I done that because it's something that I don't like myself because she was a sane parent herself and she was like so sorry because it's not something that I you know something that I really try to avoid and I was like, don't worry about it I was just you know points made let's move on yeah. <laughs> but it's it is, I think it's done uh, without or oh, sometimes it's done without malice sometimes it's done with intent to sort of put you back in your box sort of thing we are the professionals here you're just a mum and I'm like yeah no nope, I don't do fit in a box <laughs> 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 it's just oh and I know I've said it so many times now but it's just like just why can't everyone just work together and it's even that you know story you just told then it's, it sounds quite funny in a way because at least that Senko she realized and yeah. she said sorry and that's what it's not about us pointing out the mistakes but you're not doing this you're it's actually yeah. you know what you did a great thank you for helping me all parents yeah. want is to be supported when we are yeah. and even to get to that I mean I never used to ask for help because you do feel a bit embarrassed and ashamed so when you have the courage to be like actually I'm going to get help and support and then no one helps you it's like oh actually what yeah. so I grew up all that it? courage and actually let me just you know I'll just drift away but I think just wait in the corner yes I can't wait in the corner I really want to encourage if a parent's listening to this and you are struggling right now with your child or in your life I st I don't want th these to be kind of like negative and these are all the failings of the no. system because we have to keep going I promise things will change eventually but enough of us have to keep voicing our opinions and actually there are good people out there we've just got to find them and there are a lot of organizations out there as well aren't there Beth that oh yeah there's, there's there. loads of organizations that for each different area yeah. um and, and the, especially sort of the online community is a massive support because they are I mean I don't know where I would be with most I've like met loads of, of people that I'm now really close friends with just via Twitter alone um and it's it, it's such an important part of finding out what's going on because you don't it's not accessible it's never accessible so it's like you have to find ways to navigate the system in any way that you can so if that's Facebook groups or or Twitter or you know and just asking the question then you've got to do what you've got to do that, and that's how me and Beth connected actually I think when <laughs> I this was a good few months ago when they first kind of got rid of my son from that school I just literally went to Twitter and I hadn't yeah. been on Twitter for years. And I went on there, I posted a video of what was going on. And then I was like, oh my God, there is loads of other parents. I was shocked. The amount yeah. of other parents that 
ha- had gone through what I'm going through yeah. and are currently going through it. I was blown away and as people like yourself and all the other amazing ladies that are going to come on the podcast as well that it kind of give it's really weird to say this but it gives you that hope and also makes you feel like you're not alone even though yeah. it's difficult to hear other people's stories like yourselves and everyone else it does make you think okay do you know what there's people out there going through the same thing yeah. they're, they're not giving up they keep going. They're trying to help others at the same time. So I just want to say thank you. I want to get emotional now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I need to stop doing this. <laughs> um, I do think knowing that you're not the only parent going through it because so many parents go to meetings and things and, and because you are made to feel like you're just being difficult, it is very easy to be in that mindset where you would think, oh my God, is it me? Am I just, you know, is it me? And then you suddenly come across other people that are going through the same sort of things. And it's just that it empowers you as a parent because you just yeah. think, okay, right, it's not just me. There we go. And that, I think, gives you a little bit of strength and encouragement to yeah. say, right, on we go. And, and and it's just that, I think. And and it's even if even on the worst days when you think, oh, I cannot, you know, I cannot do it. If I, when I get to the stage where I'm just like, my head is banging, we're all, and everybody has those days. doesn't matter how many years you've been fighting the system and everything else, or you're going to have those days, but just take a day out of it. Take it, it's not, the world's not going to fall out of it. You're not going to end up with no support if you just take a day out to re-straighten your head, get yourself back into it. But the important thing is to get back up and get into it because there is people out there that will help. I was like, oh God, that's such a, it's such a great tip, especially that, because this, it becomes your full-time job, doesn't it? You're just, you're going, you're going and going. And even recently, I just got ill because you just keep going without taking that break. So please, number one, complain. (laughs) And like, we need to relabel that. I hate that word because we're not complaining. We're highlighting the failures yeah. of what's yeah. going on so please I know it's draining but please try and go down as many routes as you possibly can do what Beth said keep that paper trail as well cc emails to yourself keep that folder that you always know is there it's like your gold dust <laughs> folder of things and take time for yourself like yeah. have fun and that's why on on every Monday on the mum to millionaire podcast I do something called mental health Mondays where we tackle this and it's your time to de-stress so you want if you want that 20 minutes for yourself every Monday tune in because we do guided meditations hypnosis and it's just a great way to just just calm down yeah. and just Be feel there. like yourself this is yeah. like you know because this is a a part of our lives isn't it we are yeah. we are in yes we're mums but we also are you know ourselves <laughs> if that yeah. makes sense yeah you know we've got these identities and it's so important to tap back into actually who we who we are yeah. Beth you are amazing <laughs> so much love thank you for your time go and give Beth a follow on Twitter um so your username is Fantastic. <laughs> and it's Beth underscore tastic. Yeah. So make sure you go and give her a follow. Go and read, or you're gonna like come across a wealth of information that Beth's got on her page. <laughs> so make sure you go and check her out. And there'll be a lovely little recap um, on Instagram as well. So if you go to Instagram.com forward slash mum to millionaire, I'm gonna get a nice little picture of of Beth, if Beth doesn't mind uh, sending me one, we'll put a little uh, profile of her up on there as well. And do you know what? Last message is keep going. We've got to keep going. Thank you so much, Beth. Thank you. Bye. Bye. (laughs) Oh, thank you. (laughs) Yeah, I I knew that we went, that was like nearly an hour. A tangent. (laughs) We can see what doesn't exist and choose to rise above what is. Mum to millionaire.com.